Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today again at the James D. Julia Auction House up in Maine, and I am taking a look today at the Lamat Grape Shot Revolvers that they have coming up for sale in their March of 2016 auction. Now, finding one of these is pretty cool. They're fantastic, really interesting guns. They're a neat concept, they're neat mechanically, they have this cool Civil War uh, Confederacy legacy to them. Uh, one is cool, two is really cool, five is a really outstanding opportunity to look at some of the differences between them. So I have done some previous videos on these guns and I'm going to let those stand and if you're interested in the history I would refer you to those videos. What I want to do today is take a look at the variety of the guns that we have here today. So what we have here are first off a, a very early Belgian made, basically a pre-production prototype uh, very cool to look at, very few of these still exist. So definitely we'll, we'll take a look at the features of that one. And then we have two that are early first model guns, uh, serial number 8 and serial number 88. And uh, even cooler, these are both actually known provenance property of Confederate generals, so that's a neat added feature. And then we have two more that are much later guns, and these would be, um, they're considered second pattern Lamat revolvers, and one's in the middle and one's very late. So we'll take a look at those as well. And what we can do is trace the progression of how this design changed over time, which is pretty cool and something we don't normally get to do because Lamat revolvers are so rare and expensive these days. So let's get right to it. All right, we'll start with this, the very early gun. So this was made in Belgium by a guy named August Francot, uh, who was a major manufacturer of firearms at the time. Uh, if we look up close, you can see a crown over an AF. That's a Francot mark. And there are a couple of those elsewhere on the gun as well. Um, yeah. We can also see right here on the cylinder an ELG in an oval. That is a Belgian proof house proof mark. So the reason for this was that Lamont was looking for manufacturers in Europe to build his pistols. He had a couple of prototypes made in the United States, and it would appear that those were used as a model for a number of additional guns to be made by Frank Hott. These probably would have been used as samples <coughs> when visiting other potential contract manufacturers to show them, look, here's what we want you to produce. Uh, this one is actually serial numbered 16, although it's serial numbered on internal areas where I can't easily show you the numbers, uh, underside of the barrel, back face of the cylinder, that sort of thing. Um, and this is one that I don't really want to take apart. Um, a couple of things to point out. So the, the lockup between the barrel and the frame here is this type of joint, which will change very quickly on the production guns. You'll also notice it has a hammer that is shaped very much like a traditional revolver hammer. So it's a very high spur, a bit narrow, uh, checkered, you know, run it like that. And there is no mechanism to help you lower uh, the hammer face here. So what you do, I should point this out for people who aren't familiar with the Lamat, you have a nine round revolver cylinder, and these were typically 42 caliber, and then you have a central shotgun bore uh, that acts as the cylinder axis. And this would typically be 18 gauge. Now, in order to change to fire between the two, you put percussion caps on all of them, and when the hammer is in this position, it will fire the cylinders, or the chambers, all in succession. And then you can pivot the hammer face down like this, and then when you fire it, that hammer face will land on this central percussion cap, which fires the shotgun bore. So, on this early Belgian-made gun, you, you kind of have to grab it and wiggle it down. Yeah, it's not hard, but you can see how that might be troublesome in combat if your hands were cold or gloved or wet or muddy or anything like that. So uh, There are a number of brass features on this pistol. The lanyard ring down here is a fixed large brass piece. Trigger guard is brass. You'll notice that we have a ramrod on the right side of the gun. Now to use this, it has a little snap hook up here, and then you pull it back like so. So to use the ramrod, you line up a cylinder, a chamber, with the rammer, 
put in your powder, seat your ball, and then ram it like so. Now, you also have this shotgun bore, and you've got to have a way to deal with that. So what they did was they built a second ramrod in as this lever. So if I take the end here and unthread it slightly, I can then pull out an additional ramrod, and I would use this to manually pack a charge into the shotgun barrel. And then when I'm done, this screws right back in so that you don't lose it. And when you're not using it, this whole thing latches up nice and securely right there. All right, so now let's take a look at how, how things changed between these early samples and the first series, the first production series of Revolver. All right, I have now added serial number eight of the production Lamotte. This is, in fact, the personal, ver pretty well documented property of General Beauregard, one of the really particularly famous Southern generals. Now, a lot of things stayed the same. You can see the, the ramrod lever is basically identical. Um, one major change was the trigger guard. Uh, a spur was added. So this is you know, kind of like you'd see later on a Smith & Wesson number three. Uh, you've got an extra finger hold down there. So like this. Not a particularly comfortable way to hold the gun, in my opinion, but obviously uh, that was the trend of the time. The other major change you'll see visually is the shape of the hammer. So the early guns had this very high, kind of typical revolver hammer, but that's not easy to grasp from a firing grip. In fact, it's, you can't really grasp it from a firing grip. The first pattern of production Lamats did change that. So you've got this much wider, checkered, uh, and lower paddle that is graspable from a firing grip. Uh, definitely a big improvement. This made the gun handle quite a bit better. Um, a slightly less significant change is down here on the butt of the gun. We have a swiveling lanyard ring as opposed to this fixed loop. So that's indicative of the first pattern of guns. Now in total, uh, this pattern, uh, a total of 8,000 were initially ordered. Uh, 5,000 for the Confederate Army and another 3,000 for the Confederate Navy. That order would never fully materialize, uh, but that's what was initially placed. All right, now we have two of these. I have added serial number 88 down here. This was the property of Confederate General John Lawson Lewis. Uh, not quite as notable of a general as Beauregard. Um, I don't think there are any Confederate generals quite as notable as Beauregard, or not many. Um, however, these are both first pattern guns. Now, one might look at this and go, you know, man, what are the, what are the chances of having two general, Confederate general-owned Lamatt revolvers like this? Well, there's actually a reason that this sort of thing happened. Lamatt was not a fool. Um, he was a pretty savvy businessman. And he made a bit of a habit of giving Lamatt revolvers to influential people in military circles in the hopes that it would help him get contracts. And I think, by and large, it did. Um, Beauregard was an ordnance officer at the time. Uh, Beauregard was also a partner with Lamont. So find there are a couple other documented general's pistols. Uh, in fact, Stonewall Jackson had one, which we should point out, the location is unknown. It is still out there waiting to be found or possibly destroyed. But um, So here we have a couple of uh, first pattern guns. Now I'm going to take a closer look at Lawson's because there's another feature that I want to show you here and that is this lever. Now the way the Lamat is assembled, the shotgun barrel is threaded right out here under this ring, and the shotgun barrel just passes through this uh, center section here, and to disassemble one, what you do is you have to unlock the barrel from the frame, which on these first pattern guns you do simply by pressing down this lever, and then the whole barrel assembly unthreads. So if I press that lever down, I can then unscrew there we go. I can unscrew the barrel assembly. The cylinder comes right off. And there's the frame. So that's how these disassemble. And on these early guns. So on these early guns, that was the, the barrels were locked in place by this spring-loaded catch. And that was kind of an expensive part to manufacture. 
you know, obviously it's a separate piece. You have to make sure that the catch lines up well um, with this machined notch in the frame. So as you'll see in a minute, that's something that will change. Um, also, just to point out, you will see these grooves. These are not uh, threading. This is actually just a series of grooves for black powder fouling to sit in. That helps ensure that the cylinder continues to rotate smoothly even when it is fouled. It gives the, the fouling a place to go until you clean the gun and get rid of it. All right, now in total, by the way, we're back to Beauregard's pistol here, and then we have a second model gun. Uh, this particular one is serial number 1329. Now, in total, there were about 450 of these first model guns made. Um, I think the latest serial number known to exist still is 458. And then there were about 1,500 or 14, eh, about 1,500 of these second pattern guns made. So these, the serial numbers, start about 1,000 and go to about 2,500. You may have noticed there's a space missing there. Um, from about 450 to about 1,000 were actually English-made pistols, which, unfortunately, I don't have an example of here today. So let's take a look at the first model to the second model. By the way, these were all made in France, uh, in Paris, in fact, although it's suspected that a lot of the components were actually contracted from Belgium. You will find some Belgian proof marks and some Belgian makers insignias on some of the parts. However, the gun as a whole was contracted out of Paris. Now, a lot of stuff changed between the first and second model, um, primarily related to manufacturing tolerances or manufacturing capacity. So, um, let's see, first off, some of the, the simple things. The lanyard ring on the butt of the revolver. On the first pattern, it swivels. On the late pattern, we got rid of that. We'll just make it a fixed solid loop on the end of the, the butt cap. That's simpler to make. The spur on the trigger guard is gone. We're now down to a smooth trigger guard, which frankly, I think is an improvement anyway. And one of the most significant changes is the lever. Well, let me get to that in a moment. Uh, the ramrod has gone from the right side to the left side of the pistol. And now instead of pivoting down, it pivots up. So you now line up a cylinder, a chamber at the top and pivot this ramrod up to use it. You still have a shotgun rod in there. It's no longer threaded at the end. It's now just a press fit. You can see if we look closely here, there is a hole and a slot cut in the end of this rod and then it's crimped so that it actually puts tension on this additional shotgun rod to hold it in place so it won't come out. There we go. And then that still snaps into place. So the lever, the loading lever changed sides. The disassembly lever also changed significantly. So on the first model guns, it's this spring-loaded lever that you push in. On the later pattern guns, they changed from that lever to this plug. It's a lot simpler. You just pull it out. And from a manufacturing point of view, all you have to do is line up these two pieces and then drill a hole through them, and you're done. Definitely easier than uh, making a square notch that has to line up with that lever. Remember, this is a critical position to make sure that the chamber is lined up with the barrel when you're ready to fire. So that's important for more than just disassembly. So this first pattern uh, did improve your ability to reposition that hammer face by adding these two little wings to the side. So that helps, it's now easier to grab onto those and push that down. However, the second pattern did it, they, they finally came up with a way that really makes it easy, and that's to add this uh, lever on the back end. So all you have to do is flip that up. Simple, easy, definitely a, uh, a sequential series of improvements. All right, I wanna show you the progression of markings. On the Belgian prototype gun, there's nothing on the top of the barrel. On Beauregard's gun, which is number six, we have Colonel Lamatte's patent, and this nice fancy engraving right there. Then, by only number 88, so 80 guns later, that style has changed. It still says Colonel Lamatte's patent, but now we have a different, different style to it. Let's see if we can get them both. There we go. So we've gone from a kind of blocky script to a, a much fancier script. 
then on the second pattern guns, this will change further. So this is an early second pattern gun. You'll see it is now marked Colonel Lamatt. Uh, BTE is brevet, which is patent. SGDG, which is uh, kind of a bureaucratic standard patent abbreviation in French, and Paris. So these guns were patented in the United States, Belgium, France, and the United Kingdom, as well as, I believe, both Prussia and Württemberg. Uh, so Lamatt went out of his way to patent these everywhere to make sure that no one was going to copy his design. So on the second pattern guns, you'll find this script. This lasted until right about serial number 2000. At that point, it changed again. And our final version is, so at that point it changed again, and our final version is this, much more simplistic. Um, it still says the same thing, but now in a totally different script, it is System Lamotte, BTE again, Brevet. And how it's kind of funny is on about half of these guns, they actually misspelled it. It should say SGDG, and it actually says SCDG, Paris. Um, no explanation known for why the misspelling, I think just someone messed up. So uh, this particular gun is serial number 2473, see there. So this is considered a late pattern second model gun. All right, so there was a problem with Lamat. Um, this was getting complaints, uh, especially as the quality started to dip a little bit in manufacture. Um, these problems became a little more apparent. And the problem was with the specific lockup mechanism of the gun. So let's take a closer look. Up through about serial number 2000, and including all of the prototypes, uh, the way the Lamat worked was you'd have a hand that pushed on this ratchet to rotate the cylinder, and then the, the cylinder stop was a pin that would protrude, push straight out into one of these holes to lock the cylinder in position. So here we have. You can see the pin right there. As I pull the hammer back, that retracts. And then here's our hand to move the cylinder. That's fine. It works, but it requires a high degree of precision to make sure that that pin lines up perfectly with the holes in the cylinder. And that wasn't working very well. So Lamatt came up with a way to fix this. Uh, he replaced the pin system with a spring-loaded wedge. So you can see we have a wedge here, and then our hand is there. So again, when I cock the gun, the wedge pulls down out of, out of interaction with the cylinder, allows the hand to rotate the cylinder, and then locks back in place. This was a much simpler system. Uh, it was easier to machine, and it was easier to keep it very closely in tolerance um, to keep the, the barrel and the cylinder lined up properly. So on these later cylinders, you can see that in between the ratchet steps, you have little square cutouts, and that's where the wedge goes. The pinholes around the, the circumference here are gone. So that change takes place at about serial number 2000. Interestingly, it is approximately uh, the same place where the, the uh, marking system changes to this very simple blocky text. So that's not a perfect correlation, but it's pretty darn close. Now, not very many of these got in. Like I said, it was about 2,000, so only about 500 of these guns, less than 500 in fact, made it in out of a total of about 2,500 that were manufactured uh, and sent to the Confederacy. However, it's a very interesting change in how the Lamatt worked and clear evidence that Lamatt was continuing to improve his design and, and try and figure out how to make it better over the course of production. So externally, you can't really tell the difference easily between a pin gun like this one and a, a wedge gun like this one. However, there is a clue. On the pin guns, you have this extra little spring here, which is not on the wedge guns. This had to do with the tensioning spring for the pin. So that wasn't necessary. That is a way to visually identify between the two types, in addition to the markings on the top of the barrel and the serial numbers. So there you have them from the earliest here, pre-production, our two first pattern guns, General Beauregard's and General Lawson's, and then our early second pattern and our late second pattern. The only one missing here is an example of the English manufacturer. Well, thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Certainly uh, not a common thing to be able to put this many of these guns together in one place, and it's always interesting to see the differences between them. So 
Uh, all five of these, of course, are coming up here for sale in March at the James D. Julia Auction House. And uh, obviously the most valuable one is General Beauregard's personal sidearm, Lamatt. Uh, all the way down to, I hate to set, put it this way, but kind of a general run of the mill of Matt, you know, a standard one. Um, if you're interested in adding any of these to your own personal collection, take a look at the description text below. You will find links to all five of their catalog pages in the Julia auction catalog. Mm -hmm. That'll let you take a look at their descriptions, their provenances, and their detailed high res pictures and you can place bids online or come up here to Maine and participate in the auction live. Thanks for watching.